It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 270 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 2nd of July 2017. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Dr Shane Joseph. Hello. Penny Dumsday. Hi. And Sean Elliott. Welcome back. Hello. It's good to be back. It's been a while. It has been a while. It's been a long while. <laughs> what have you been up to? You're still doing your rough science uh yeah. Program for kids? Uh, I am. Uh, for the last year, I've sort of been back into doing that here in Melbourne. Uh, before that, I, I uh, spent about nine months or so in Edinburgh. I was working for the Edinburgh Science Festival, uh, part of their um, their their operations people uh, putting together the festival. And, yeah, since, since coming back, I've sort of been uh, doing lots of uh, programs with kids and um, holiday programs and such like. Been doing a lot of robotics, I notice. Yeah, well, that's a little bit of Arduino programming. That's that's kind of a um, one of the things that I've sort of developed is a basic kit, uh, and uh, it's called the Roughbot. And basically, it's it's <laughs> yep, <laughs> it's it's. Uh, the the intention is to be as cheap a kit as I can make it. That is a fully functioning programmable robot. Well, with two wheels. Um, so. Okay. Yeah, that's that's been an interesting project, and um, so I've I've put together uh, something and um, uh, starting to work with uh, schools to to see if we can turn it into a program. Oh, very cool! Hmm. So, is this like a kit that people can buy, or like off you, or do you just sort of say get all these different parts, put them together? Yeah, uh, it's it's open source, so people can get the part list and just simply uh, source it themselves. And then the other side of it is that I do have uh, the parts all sourced and put together, so that you you can buy them off me. It isn't quite set up yet to buy off me just yet, <laughs> but in a probably about three weeks' time, uh, it probably will be. So. I'll, I'll uh, be sure to let you know then. Is there a site that people should keep checking every so often to yeah. see for themselves when it's ready? Uh, roughscience.net is my, my site for rough science in general and um, all announcements and so on come, come through that as well as a uh, an email that they can sign up to. So if you're a teacher and you're interested in this sort of thing, by all means, sign up. Um, if even if you don't want to buy the kit, uh, I, I'm putting out sort of open source uh, things that you can do with Arduino and programming in general through that site too. Very cool. What sort of age groups would you recommend it for the teachers? Yeah, uh, this is an interesting one. It's um, I, I've been trialling it with uh, a range of age groups in secondary. Um, in general, it's uh, probably best for the lower secondary, so uh, year seven, year eight. Um, but it could stretch down to uh, grade five and six, and stretch upwards to um, year nine and ten. But mainly, mainly at this point, it's it's sort of been trialled out on year seven and eight, uh, in particular in the um, sort of the ICT. Um, parts of the curriculum that have, have been coming about these last couple of months. Very cool. We'll have a, uh, a new generation of roboticists <laughs> coming up. Well, that's all my, you know, my, finally my my evil robot army will come about, <laughs> albeit very slowly and very small on two wheels. <laughs> Stop building Daleks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but Ed... Oh. They'll turn on you eventually. <laughs> it's inevitable. Just call me Davros. All right. We should get started. But before we begin, I want to point out that the only reason we can keep on doing this show is because of our wonderful Patreon subscribers. Just go to scienceontop.com slash donate and you'll be able to chip in a little bit if you want to. And so we want to thank the incredible Ryan James, the excellent Dan Kruger and Brett Henry, and the marvellous EJ, Chris Curtin-McGee, Sean McElligot, Richard Sutherland and Pete Ellinger. Thank you all so much for your contributions. Now Shane, let's begin with wildebeest. And every year 1.2 million blue wildebeests migrate across East Africa, accompanied by around 200,000 zebra and antelope. 
It's one of the most astonishing mass migrations on the planet. And at one point in their travel, they have to cross the mighty Mara River, and many of them don't make it. They drown. But the story only begins there, really, doesn't it? Yeah, um, I never much thought about this apart from the occasional nature documentary where you see, you know, herds of wildebeests across the Serengeti and then you see them at rivers and then you see... Thundering majestically across the plane. Yes, that too. (laughs) (laughs) You know, behind the Sydney Opera House and all the rest of it. (laughs) Sorry, that's a Faulty Towers reference in case anyone's... I couldn't help it. (laughs) In case anyone's just too young for it because we're all old. (laughs) Anyway, um, yeah, so as I said, apart from the occasional... um, nature documentary where you see a crocodile, you know, you see a bunch of these poor herbivores trying to cross a river and then this croc comes from nowhere and drags one of them down um, and kills it. That's apparently not their main problem. Um, then one of their main problems is the fact that for every every wildebeest that gets killed by a croc, about 50 more of them actually just drown because they're just dumb herbivores, basically. <laughs> um, really. That's because they haven't learned to swim. Yeah, pretty much. Oh. I know. Evolution has failed them, if you want to go that well, way. Well, this anyway, is evolution point... in action in many ways, but anyway. Well, uh, it is, actually. Yeah. To, to be honest, it is. It, it's actually quite brilliant. Um, uh, <laughs> not brilliant. You know what I mean. Yeah. This is getting awkward. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, look, I, I find this so fascinating. And the, the thing is, this article is, again, written by the, the um, incomparable Ed Yong. Um, this man can make... You know, bacterial growth sound interesting. Anyway, um, <laughs> he, the way he describes this is basically, well, first of all, you should probably look up a map of the wildebeest migration because it's quite, it's huge. And it's not just, you know, across from one point to another. It's a big circle and it goes around, um, you know, from between Kenya and Tanzania across a huge um, area. And <clears throat> it's about in sort of July and August where they get to the Mara. So I guess they have the Northern Hemisphere in summer. I guess that's about right. Um, yeah, and then so they run across the river and a lot of them fail and they quite a few hundred of them drown. So apparently this, this researcher has seen up to 300 carcasses wedged into the riverbank. Right. And that might seem quite grisly, and it is. But apparently it's very, it's very important for the surrounding ecosystem and it's very important for the actual sort of health, quote unquote, of the river. When you think about how much you know, rotting meat is in that river. But th- then think about how many nutrients it's these bodies are leaching as they rot. Think about the downstream effects of that, and you know what comes to feed on the on the carcasses. Um, what goes what feeds on the carcasses hundreds of miles downstream. It's apparently uh, look, they, they make an analogy. They say it's like dumping ten blue re- blue whales into the river every year with these wow. with these um, drowning events. Mm. So. As horrible as they might seem, it actually seems to be quite important for the you know health of the whole ecosystem. What I find very interesting about this is that these mass drownings are probably less common than they used to be, simply because populations have dropped, um, because you know the humans have actually hunted them more, and because and through you know various events like um, land re- uh, reclamation and stuff, their populations have dropped. So actually. Um, this might not reflect what it used to be at all. It might be even, you know, it might be boom, the ecosystem might be suffering because of the because of fewer um, of these mass drownings. Mm. So yeah, it's just <laughs> it's a really cool. It's it's something that I hadn't really thought about before. I probably should have because I'm a biologist. <laughs> <but> <laughs> it's it, it's yeah, it's it's a whole. You know, I hate to say to use this term, but it's it's kind of the circle the circle of life. You know the. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> Actually, they make a well, they make a really nice um, reference to the Lion King in this article. And they say well, instead of instead of you know a monkey holding aloft the lion cub, they should have just hold, held up a rotting wildebeest and said, you know, this is the symbol. <laughs> Simba, <laughs> the wilderness cross here, and then drown horribly <laughs> by the hunters. And then <laughs> uh, that would have really yeah. really put a spin on that uh, cartoon if we. Oh uh, yeah, that would be a very different <laughs> show. <laughs> Probably better. <laughs> yeah, I said it. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, come on. <laughs> I cried when, when Mufasa died. Oh, sorry. Spoilers. Oh, no. Sorry. Yeah. Gee, you've mm. ruined it for me now. Uh, 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 um. I'm, I'm going to say it now. Scar was given a rotten <laughs> Anyway, I'm just going to say it. <laughs> but it's also important to remember that, I mean, this is 
probably going to this affects every sort of level of that uh, ecosystem yep. in terms of you know it's the crocodiles and your uh, apex predators, mm -hmm. your your big animals. It's your microbes as well that are feeding off it, and it's everything in between. It's yep. a surprisingly important uh, aspect to it, and it's just so nice that so many wildebeest are giving up their life <laughs> for the yes. betterment of the ecosystem. Oh yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes. Well, I, I'm sure that I'm sure they have a big uh, sort of powwow at the start and say, "Guys, I know this is going to sound rough, <laughs> but at least a few hundred of you are going to wind up dead in the river. But it's all for the greater cause. <laughs> the greater good. No, it's it, <laughs> the greater good. Yeah, I mean, it's it is quite fascinating, and it's again, I, I just love that sort of the study that's going to do this and the recognition that, you know, this is all part of that sort of equilibrium of the system. And, mm. Yeah, yeah. That, that it serves a purpose. And, you know, our gut reaction may be to, oh, how can we help them cross the river? Yeah. You know, do we build bridges or whatever? But but no, it's the sort of yeah. thing where we sh shouldn't intervene. We should just let nature take its course. And otherwise, you know, other people, other animals down the food chain will be pretty much yeah. for, uh, better off. So it's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, let's move on and talk about quantum. And less than a year after they launched the world's only quantum communications satellite, Chinese researchers have for the first time ever sent entangled photons from space to grounded stations on Earth. Sean, tell me that means something to you <laughs> and tell us what it means. Okay, okay. Well, uh, first, a little disclaimer at the start is the, the, the famous quote that says that uh, if you think you understand quantum, you don't understand quantum. <laughs> um, but I am going to take a, a, a sideways step here and not talk about quantum, but talk about encryption just for a moment. Uh, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, what the Chinese have done is a well. It's 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 beyond the proof of concept. Um, it's it's breaking a record for achieving a an important step in uh, quantum encryption and quantum uh, communication. Now, just uh, to forget about quantum for a second, just to talk about encryption. The um, whole idea about encryption is that we get some plain text, something that we can read, uh, and we want to send it from one person to another person without somebody in between uh, being able to, to to read it. Usually when they talk about encryption, they talk about send Alice is sending a, a message to Bob without someone in the middle, Charlie, being able to read it. So A, B, and C. So uh, Alice takes this message that she can read. She encrypts it in some way she sends it to bob bob then decrypts it and is able to read it now usually you need to be able to tell bob how to decrypt the message and what we can do is we can take a key that actually decrypts the message and and send it with the message um so the bob gets gets the uh the, the message and is able to decrypt it using the key but if charlie manages to intercept the message, he's got the key. So what's what's another way of doing it? Well, we could have two separate keys, um, one that Alice has got and, and one that Bob has got. And um, there's particular methods of encryption these days where you can encrypt a message using uh, a, a, a key and a different key will be able to decrypt it. Um, again, we still have this issue of if somebody encounters the key uh, they're able to to decrypt your message until we start to combine this with quantum mechanics. Now, here's where we just leave <laughs> encryption to one side for a second and just turn to this rather uh, curly thing of, of quantum physics and quantum mechanics, in particular, something which is called entanglement. So something that, uh, and, and actually the history of this is, is, is fascinating because it came out of some work that Einstein did, but Einstein didn't like the implications of it. Um, essentially, mm. it, it goes like this, that if we have two subatomic particles, say two photons, two packages of light, that we're able to entangle them in such a way that they have a particular property that's a shared across them. Now, usually it's in, in, in terms of these sorts of things, it's um, things like direction of spin and 
and things like this. But for, for, for the sake of just keeping it simple, let's just say that we, we have two particles and we put them into a state and we'll call it, you know, they, it could be in state zero or it could be in state one. So, um, we can set one in one state and it, and it influences the, the other entangled particle. So Einstein didn't like this idea because the implication is if you take one particle and put the other one a great distance away, for some reason that we're still not entirely sure why, mm. if you change one of these particles, it will change the other one no matter how far apart you put them. And Einstein hated this because basically it was it was it was just <laughs> I bet he did, yeah. it, it it just broke down his because it defies all reasoning. It defies all reasoning, and on top of that, it, <laughs> it defies this whole limit to the universe that he imposed with um, the speed of light. Nothing could travel faster mm. than the speed of light. Now, if nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, how is it that the information can effectively ch- jump from one particle to another? what seems to be instantaneously. Or at least that's what the equations seem to indicate. It wasn't until the 1980s that they actually were able to do this in laboratory over very small distances. Uh, Essentially, they're able to produce um, entangled photons uh, through through a procedure with some um, calcium atoms where they uh, they're, they're able to essentially excite the uh, calcium atoms and uh, the calcium atoms then uh, emit some uh, photons which is something that you might recall happens all the time in chemistry when when you're um, uh, adding energies to to certain um, atoms to and and changing the states of of the electrons within the the shells around the outside now there's there's an extra step that you can make and it instead of emitting one photon it emits two and they're entangled and this was what happened in the 80s now that's all well and good but what what do we do now with these two photons how do we then kind of separate them now so the idea initially was, well, okay, maybe we could send one to another location using uh, optic fibers. Now, the trouble with optic fibers, no matter how um, uh, uh, how clear the glass is that you make your optic fiber, you're still going to end up with a certain number of impurities. And so there there seems to be a certain limit that uh, we've been able to, to do with optic fibers. The current record, I think, is 404 kilometers that they've been able to separate it. And so the yep. uh, this Chinese group have now trying it by actually sending a satellite into space and then sending the our, our entangled photons to two locations on Earth. Again, you still have a bit of an issue with uh, things traveling through the atmosphere. You, you, you're going to be interacting with particles and this destroys the entangled states. But what seems to have happened is that our Chinese... Uh, satellites have been able to achieve um, sending our two entangled photons over a massive distance. So 1,200 kilometers uh, between two cities on Earth. So that is a major step in our uh, quantum entanglement and quantum communication. And so the idea is that this is along the way to setting up a quantum um network around the earth uh of of using these things so essentially you are then building a method of communicating faster than the speed of light yes and well is that right um the the primary thing that they're they're looking at at the moment is mainly about uh quantum encryption so it's less about communicating at a a speed of light, but uh, being able to communicate in a very secure method. Now, I mentioned before that um, with encryption, if somebody sends you a key, uh, somebody else could intercept it. And you wouldn't know. If somebody else intercepts your key, uh, that's it, Mm. it's gone. But in this case, uh, because of the, the nature of quantum, if you measure a particle, it's in the act of measuring a particle, it actually changes its state. And so the idea is that if you have two quantum entangled particles, you know if somebody has stepped in to actually uh, look at the key because the act of actually intercepting and measuring the key changes the um, 
the entanglement and uh, can effectively either break it down or, or change it in a way that you know that somebody has actually uh, stepped in to do it. So it makes the communication incredibly secure. Um, that uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's no doubt that somebody's looking. Except, at- except how would that how would that manifest though? In a, in a real life situation, like how would it change? The ah, and at this point, this is where my my knowledge ever so slightly breaks down, <laughs> like a pair of quantum entangled photons. Um, <laughs> see what I did there? See what I did there? And it, yes, but, yes, but yes, uh, the, the, the way I understand it from from uh, what I was reading about the uh, the basic ideas behind this research uh, is that the the, the key itself. Um, will have changed now what it looks like i i don't know um uh here's where uh you know the the research into quantum at the moment uh quantum encryption is is very very uh very much in its infancy and um yeah uh so i don't know <laughs> that's that's fair i was just because sort of, look th- th- this basically makes my head hurt on that on that mm. scale that you've been talking about, and so I can't even imagine how it would manifest into a real life situation where you're actually sending, you know, information that is I don't know like a like a, I don't know we'll say a, a, even a short sentence, for example, mm. through, through you know and, and how and how would that affect how would that be affected by interference, and how would you yeah. affect that like that just I can't even imagine how that works. So, so I'm, I'm going to go on a, on a slight limb here just in terms of uh, my understanding of it. So you'd send your, your message uh, normally, mm. and so you end up with a, a, a ciphertext. But in order to decrypt it, um, that's where you need to uh, – you, you'll get a series of photons that will be in a series of particular states coming in. Uh, so you, your, your states would be one zero A B, and um, and from that you're able to gem- generate your key that decrypts your message. Um, so at the moment, the way that they're they're detecting these photons is uh, using um, photon telescopes, which are basically pointed upwards as the um, as the uh, um, satellite goes overhead. It mm. Uh, your ground-based machinery is just sort of saying, you know, it's, it's detected this and this is the state that it's in. So um, I, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say right. it would be yep. uh, something along those lines. Um, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Mm. So A but- photon telescope. Uh, is that basically an optical telescope? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just let's... You, you, you've caught me on the hop. I, I feel like we're maybe pushing past the uh, boundary of your knowledge on this, so I should uh, <laughs> probably... Uh, I think we've got the gist of it and that this yeah. is a pretty extraordinary thing. Absolutely. Uh, so, so in terms of... They're, they're, they're saying they're uh, small telescopes uh, to focus the photons uh, to a distant receiver. So, um, yeah, this this particular receiver, it's known as uh, an optical telescope, uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is kind of like, well, isn't that what telescopes or Normal telescopes. <laughs> yes. But all telescopes do. Yeah. <laughs> Except for radio ones, but yeah. Uh, anyway. Oh, very cool. Um, I just love the idea of, entanglement over vast distances and i mean you're talking the encryption and everything but to me it just seems a useful way of communicating uh over vast distances without actually sending a photon across the photons are already there you're just sort of changing them and that's sort of yeah stuff. but uh yeah there's there's so many things that can come out of this which i think is mind absolutely very cool it's fantastic yeah. Well, while we're talking quantum, we should probably talk about the quantum chimpanzees. <laughs> and penny scientists in Uganda have noticed that the hunting behaviour of chimpanzees changed when they were being watched. <laughs> the act of observation, as it were, changes the thing that's being observed. See what I did there? Ooh. <laughs> nice. So what's going on here? Yeah, I thought this was quite interesting because, I mean, I think we've all seen documentaries where... They strap like a radio transmitter the size of a brick onto a duck <laughs> and go, oh, it has no idea it's there. Yeah, they don't fly as far. <laughs> it's just going to behave normally. <laughs> but what about with um, different kinds of study methods? And this is looking at two different groups of chimpanzees and seeing, well, how does it 
how does the presence of human researchers affect the chimpanzee's behaviour? And chimps obviously are quite intelligent animals. They probably have their own culture in a way. So not they're not just behaving on instinct and genetics. But what if people studying a group of chimps essentially affected their group behaviour and ch changed their culture, affected their natural behaviour? So the research looked at two different groups of chimps um, called Sonso and Waibira chimps, and they lived in the same um, forest in Uganda next door to each other, so neighbouring groups of chimps. The Sonso chimps had been studied for a, a very long time by people, but the Waibira chimps um, have only been studied for the past, I think, five years or so. And what has been found is that it seems to be that they're quite sensitive to the human presence. So the Sonso chimps hunt in small groups cooperatively and they hunt for colobus monkeys, which they, um, you know, eat and share, whereas the Waibira chimps, uh, they hunt by themselves. They're a bit more opportunistic in what they hunt and they'll hunt things like little deer and so on. A monkey, the monkeys are apparently quite tricky to catch. They require cooperation. But these other kinds of prey animals you can just kind of grab on your mm. own. I thought this was really interesting because um, there's a little video in the article Ed Lynch which essentially shows a human researcher trailing around after the chimps. And she makes the point that um, that five years of study, while it might seem to be a long time, is only a small fraction of an adult chimp's life. Some of them can oh, be yeah, 30 yeah. or 40 years old. And so you might think, oh, yeah, we've been there for ages. They're used to us. Well, it's actually still a kind of unknown thing. In the group of chimps that are more used to humans, some of those chimps have grown up with humans. And because they've been studied for such a long term, you can see that the effect of the disruption through historical data, that they have only recently gone back to hunting those colobus monkeys, whereas the other group is still, the group that's um, only just recently started to be studied is still being affected. And it's really interesting because I guess the question is, you know, why do this or why do it in this way? Like if it is affecting their behaviour and, you know, the reason to study the chimps is to, you know, help preserve them, they're an endangered species, I believe, then this method of study, even though it might be the best for humans so we can get more information and so on, might not be the best. So it could be that now technology has improved, camera traps, remote microphones, maybe drones, mm -hmm might be better but i can also see an argument that maybe chimps could sort of get used to a human but a drone could also be quite disruptive sure. and scary yeah. i mean like i'm not dumb i'd freak out if all of a sudden <laughs> there was a drone <laughs> following me and i don't think a chimp is much <laughs> yeah well, I, th I think th there has been um studies where there was observed elephants which are freaked out by bees that they're like tuned in to be aware of the buzzings of bees mm. Mm. Um, because they can actually get up their trunk and annoy cool. them and yeah. cause all sorts of trouble. So elephants freak out when they hear bees and they freak out when they hear drones buzzing yeah. overhead as well. So that's another sort of way where you, we're, we're mm. trying to be unobtrusive, but we're still uh, impacting on the natural way. Do you, do you guys remember there was a, do a documentary series a few years ago? I, I can't remember if it was a David Attenborough one or not. I don't think it was because it was quite clumsy. But they they hid they hid a camera in poo or what was supposed to look like poo, like a and and they like you know amongst um lion prides and things like that and it was just this poo can and it was following them around like that and it was supposed to be an unobtrusive look into you know what an animal actually does when you haven't got a cat, when you haven't got a photographer hiding behind a tree looking at them all the time. At, or hiding in or poop. Like, yeah, well, yeah. The point was, yeah, the worst person not was there. Of course, some of the some of the animals yeah. figured it out, and they're like, "What's that? That's not right." And they and they attacked it. But before that, it was this sort of fascinating, you know, concept of let's try to be unobtrusive here. Let's actually try to look at them without them thinking that someone's there and them on edge. And I don't know. I, I, I like the concept. I'm not, I'm not sure how well it was executed, but it was. <laughs> 
So, Penny, am I right in understanding that what we're basically saying here is the tribe that had been studied for a long time, that was used to humans following them around, they acted more cooperatively in hunting these colobus monkeys, but the other tribe that has only recently been studied, they're still acting sort of independently, we'll catch whatever we yeah. can. They're a bit kind of... Um wary freaked out they're on edge well i'm i think i'm probably reading right too. It's okay a bit so too much. because but they're not yeah. relaxed they're not working cooperatively and that sort of a thing mm-hmm. where it's the okay so it's not so much that we have by observing this one tribe made them act more cooperatively they always no no we think they were always cooperative. They're just used to us when people come they get um more skittish they change their behavior mm. But when they real, you know, when the people are fully just normalised, they can go back to that cooperative behaviour. That that was my understanding. Right. Anyway. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Gotcha. I actually wonder how much Jane Jane Goodall, if Jane Goodall sort of saw the same sort of thing, because she, she. Yeah, it's she was very close. Yeah. And I also wonder, like, I mean, we think our oh, science, we we absolutely shouldn't affect or change anything. But I mean, is it even possible to study? things like this without or in such intelligent creatures without sort of mm. having any, I don't know. I'm not quite sure what I'm saying, but yeah. No, I mean, you then need to also justify why we need to study these creatures if there's no way to do it unobtrusively mm. sort of thing. Mm, mm. And then you go down but an then, ethical rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting because like when we study them, it changes us too, but I guess we've consented to that in a way. Mm. Um Anyway, if you're talking, if, yeah, it is a bit of a. If you're pop. talking pure just observation, um, in terms of I don't know, like I, I don't see. I mean, I'd be for looking at the behaviour of these sorts of animals in that, like, in a way that is natural. If you want to, if you want to use that term, like, in a way that doesn't make them feel like we're kind of being watched here. And I, I don't know. It, it's yeah, like because because that's just harder. It's than- very hard, but surely that's a much more representative idea of how animals behave than if you know than just walking around behind. Yeah, them. yeah. <laughs> but then how would you do that, know. especially yeah. if they're quite wide? I, I really yeah. don't know. That's the point. Like I mean, and, and that's kind of what I was getting with that whole poo cam ex- ex- yeah. example of you know mm. that was supposed to mimic nature, like flea cam. Or so, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Look, it's not that far away, you know. We mm. can probably do a lot of stuff with nanotechnology now and micro engineering. Mm. Who knows? And I think, too, it depends on uh, what it is that you're observing. So, uh, for instance, there was a documentary that was done in the north of Australia where uh, a researcher was walking into mangroves and leaving cameras uh, just at the level of the mudplains themselves. And what he found was you, you go walking through a mangrove and you, you barely see anything. And But the moment that he walks away, what the cameras picked up were uh, hundreds, like hundreds of crabs crawling up out of the mud mm. and and scurrying about and, and doing whatever it is that they're doing. And then as soon as he walked back to, to collect the ca- uh, uh, cameras again, they, they would all just disappear back into holes. Yeah. And you would... You, you would not you would not know that they they were there uh, if you were just wandering through. So, uh, as as you're saying, it d- depends on the level of obtrusiveness uh, as to and and I suppose ultimately um, what it is that you're studying that whether whether they're going to get freaked out by it. Mm. And that's probably why we've never really seen Bigfoot or hobbits. <laughs> <laughs> that's what. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Oh, there's Sorry. still a chance for that Loch Ness monster. <laughs> Yeah, oh, it swims away whenever you get in the lake. Yeah, something. Yeah, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. Uh, there's there's only one way to find it, which is to drain the lake. <laughs> uh, yes, drain the whole of Loch Ness, or you know, have many gazillion liters there are out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's going to work. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, simultaneously destroying the yeah, habitat yeah, yeah. of the Loch Ness but, monster, but we've now definitively been able to say <laughs> that there was a Loch Ness monster or not. Just another ethical rabbit hole that we're going down. (laughs) (laughs) But while we're on the topic of observing nature and the natural world, Shane, we expect eggs to be egg-shaped. But a surprising number, most actually, of bird eggs are not the traditional egg-shaped. They're a lot pointier. 
and two researchers from Princeton and Harvard universities have teamed up to figure out why. So why are eggs shaped with a pointy end and a round bulbous end? Well, it's not even that why are they shaped like that. It's why are they shaped? Why do you get long eggs or spherical eggs at all? Um, and apparently it's very much to do with how well that egg, uh, how well the egg, how well the bird flies, um, which I think is fascinating. And it kind of also makes sense. Yeah. Um, what actually fascinated me out of all this research was apparently, and this is something I didn't know. Apparently if you take an egg of any bird and if you dissolve the shell, the membrane that's inside the egg will retain the shape of the egg, mm. which I didn't know. Okay. And that fascinated me. Oh, that, that's, that is a great experiment to try okay. out. If you get some vinegar and drop an egg into yeah. it, uh, you just end up with the, 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 the membrane. Right. And the membrane has the, cool. retains the shape of the egg, of the original structure. Absolutely. That's, that, that, I find that incredible, to be perfectly honest, because that's, yeah. But, um, but anyway, yeah, so basically we're used to seeing eggs in the supermarket or, you know, if you've been to a, a farm where there are chickens and, or if, 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 if you have chickens like my mother-in-law does. Um, and taking eggs, and you know, you see them, and, okay, they're egg shaped. But yeah, apparently most eggs aren't really shaped like that. So some eggs are very, very long, some eggs are very, very sort of spherical almost. I think, um, so certain birds, like, like um, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to find an example. Well, I can think of dinosaur eggs. Uh, so a lot of dinosaur eggs are, are very, very long yeah. eggs. Um, uh, but yeah, when, whenever you mention long eggs, that's uh, my immediate thought as well. Those- Jurassic Park, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is very um, that, that very accurate depiction of dinosaurs without their feathers. Anyway, uh, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, th- th- so this group basically they they did this ama- sort of very interesting study where they, they they took a whole lot of birds and bird species and plotted their egg shape against a whole lot of different um, characteristics of their lives, like, you know, their, their wingspan, etc. Yeah. And they basically found that egg, egg shape didn't sort of change with things like clutch size or anything like that. But what it did correlate with was flying ability. So apparently, like, flying ability it correlates with how, how long their sort of wingtips are to their hand bones. And that is an indication of how well they fly. And that also is quite well correlated with if their eggs are long or not. Hmm. And it kind of makes sense if you think about the way birds fly. If, if the most aerodynamic birds are a bit more sort of squashed, if you like, like their, their bodies are a bit more, you know, sort of long to, you know, to glide through the mm-hmm. air properly. And then that mm-hmm. being said, all your organs have to squash as well. So <laughs> the duct where the egg comes down is also narrowed. So the egg yep. w- will just automatically have to be a little bit narrower to fit down that narrower duct. So it makes sense when you, makes it sense. makes sense when you think about yeah. it, but in, until you make that correlation, you're like, well, why would you why would you have these you know, why would the eggs be shaped differently? And that's that's what they think is happening. Like this is all on based on modeling. Like there's no you know, they haven't Yeah, it would be Hard to do any other. Kind I know, of, yeah, of right. Losses, but I yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, th- th- that's basically it. like it, it's a bit of a trade-off here. It's like if you want to be a better flyer, you must have a longer, narrower egg, and that's essentially mm-hmm. what it boils down to. And that's what what's happening here. So yeah, I- so you get <laughs> hummingbirds, which are really good flyers, obviously, and they've got fairly symmetrical eggs, but swifts, which are not as good as uh, hummingbirds at flying, but very closely related still. They're more pointed. They're like pine nuts. Yeah. Um, and owls tend to have spherical eggs, but the better flyers among them, like barn owls, have more elliptical ones. Yeah. Hmm. Um, the, the, the exception is penguins, apparently, because, you know, they're not fly- they're flightless, but they swim. I was going to ask about yeah. flightless well, birds. But yeah. in, this, in the case of penguins, anyway, they're essentially flying, but just in a different medium. They're flying yes. underwater. Yes. So mm-hmm. it's a similar kind of thing. It's, you know, pointed rather than symmetrical. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Hmm. It's but also, uh, yeah, emu eggs tend to be sort of they're mu- oval. They're, yeah, but they're, but they're much more round. Be. They're sort of you know, and yeah. and those buggers can run fast, as I found out yeah. as a child. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> they're still uh, aerodynamic, but in a different way. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, but they obviously don't have to fly, so they've got a bit more space to you know spread their evil organs around. So, um, yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like emus. One of them chased me as a kid and I've been freaked out by them ever since. Uh. 
But it's nothing compared to the cassowary. I mean, the cassowary, oh, yes. the, oh, the, the, the yeah. bird of death <laughs> with, their, with their third claw, which will disembowel you and oh, yeah. scary things. And on that happy note. <laughs> but yeah, essentially that's the, that's the answer. It's, it's if you, if you, the better flyers will have a narrow, what's called an overduct, and that limits the width of the egg. So, yeah. Very cool. And I think that's our show. And all the links that we talked about uh, on the show notes at in the website, scienceontop.com slash 270. Let us know what you think. Leave us a comment. Get in touch with us on social media or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you like the show, don't forget scienceontop.com slash donate if you can want to make a donation on Patreon. Thanks for joining me today, Penny, Shane, and Sean. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. This episode was edited with frivolity and zaniness by Marcos Benamu. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. I'm sure when you started, you never thought about that you got to deal one day with the challenge of global warming, sea levels rise, right? Right. But the threat from nature. Throughout my career, somebody that came up and, uh, you know, flying airplanes early on, it was, it was probably something I didn't give a whole lot of thought to. But right. these days, I give a lot of thought to it. If we don't start now, in 20 years, we'll be looking back and we'll be saying, why didn't we? Why didn't we listen to the science and the engineers? Climate change is happening and we need to plan for it. I mean, he is a vice admiral with 40 years in the Navy, warning that we have got to act quickly. Our leaders are now warning that our oil addiction is gravely threatening our national security. But do we have the will and the way to end this dangerous addiction?